Welcome back to Homesick. Throughout the game so far, I haven't been able to read any of the notes or books or newspaper articles or anything of the sort, because it's all been garbled. But the last thing I did was finish putting all the letters on all the blocks that I found in the world, which automatically translates all the text. So now it's time to go back through the whole game, everywhere I've already visited, and this time actually read what all these notes have to say. Which I'm really excited to do because so far, not being able to read any of the notes has left me pretty much completely in the dark as to what the story of this game is actually about. It does seem to be about loss. Of some sort. After all, one of the things I did was put this little picture here back together, which seems to show a parent and a child. And at first, at the start of the game, it was... Uh, you only had a piece. It was ripped. So there's some sort of separation or something going on. But uh, let's find out more. So this is the very, very start. This is literally the first room that you start in. You wake up in this bed. So let's read what seems to be the first note. Dear Tosh, Thank you so much for your letter. It was nice to have a piece of you here with me as I try to get comfortable in my new place. I've been babysitting a little boy that lives on my floor. He reminds me so much of you as a little kid. We've been playing with blocks with letters on them just like the ones you used to have. My trip was amazing. The months went by very fast. It took me a long time to find the village. It was in an even more remote location than I had expected. They really are creating something new. A refuge from this crazy world. They're generating their own power with solar panels and wind turbines, and they're growing all of their own food. There are fruits, vegetables, herbs, and grains growing all over the place, and every spare inch of soil, even on rooftops and the sides of the dwellings. The most amazing thing was how hopeful everyone was. It felt so safe, and for the first time since we were kids, I felt hopeful for a better future. I wish I could have, I wish I could have stayed there longer, but I hope that the money I earn from this new job will help us buy land so that we can start a new village together. Love always, your sister. Okay, so it says I've been babysitting a little boy that lives on my floor. Could that perhaps be what this picture shows? Could that be her and the little boy that she's been babysitting, perhaps? Hello. Journal entry 15. I barely slept at all last night. I was tossing and turning for hours. I couldn't stop thinking about my new job. It is so awful here. There's so much destruction and pollution. The air is thick with smog and toxic dust. People say we're helping to provide energy, but I think there has to be a better way. I just want to earn enough money so that I can leave this place. One nice thing did happen today. For lunch, I sat with one of the other workers that happens to live on my floor. He was such a nice guy. He told me about his family and how he hopes that this place isn't too dangerous for his child. Like me, he hopes to earn enough money at this job to be able to leave and move to someplace better. I told him about my insomnia, how I can't sleep because I'm overcome with worries about how bad things are. He was so understanding and nice to talk with. I wish he and his family lived next door to me, instead of my current neighbor, the bachelor. He's so loud all the time, with his parties and dates, making it even harder for me to fall asleep. I started babysitting my co-worker's son. He's such a fun little kid. Spending time with him really lifts my spirits. He's doing so well starting to learn to read. I think his other favorite thing is to play hide-and-seek. The other day... He was playing a game of hide-and-seek with his parents, and he, ha and he hid in my apartment, and I wasn't even home from work yet. His parents went looking for him and found him in here. Oh, that seems to be it. So wait a minute, what's going on? Okay, so this journal entry is talking about how it's awful here. Pollution, destruction, this place is terrible. And that how they're just working to try to earn a living to live somewhere better. 
And it also says, I started babysitting my coworker's son. And this note over here. Talking about getting comfortable in their new place. I've been babysitting a little boy that lives on my floor. That sounds like the coworker's son that, that she's talking about. My trip was amazing. See, that's the thing, though. It sounds like this is talking about the same, the same job and the same little boy, but in here she describes the place as being great, right? Solar panel and wind turbines and all that stuff. So she's talking about a great place, but the other note is talking about a horrible place to work. Or, oh, I wish I could have stayed there longer, but I hope the money I earn from this new job will help us buy land. Oh, okay. So she went there for a bit, and then she had to come back and come start this job where everything is polluted and horrible. Okay. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. It's so quiet. I'm a cat, and you're not. That is very true. Peaceful Drift, a collection of poems about sleep and renewal. Introduction to the Science of Sleep. Yeah, she mentioned having trouble getting to sleep, because of her worries over how terrible everything is, so it sounds like she's reading a lot of books about sleep to try to try to get better. The building of strats. An underground city inhabited by two very different cultures, often at odds outside the walls. But inside, a population at peace. Alright, I think that's it for this room. It's literally completely silent. Not even any music, not any footsteps. It's weird. I don't like it. Lessons my grandfather taught me. The history of SAAB. I don't even know what SAAB is. We are separated now. As she said, but I still have years of memories of her. Memories of good times past. I still dream of her every night. But where the dreams end and the memories begin sinks to the abyss of everyday obscurity. Now only a few things still linger as a reminder that some part of it was real. The hardest part is letting go. Letting the memories blend together into my dreams. The saddest part is losing the details as the memories become only stories. It's like losing years of yourself, or years of myself, rather. Hardest part is letting go. Saddest part is losing the details. <sighs> well, that was a good time for the music to come in. <laughs> right after a heavy sigh. Yep, I knew this game would be depressing, but it's getting even more depressing. She's out there. Somewhere. Is she thinking of me? Like I'm still thinking of her? I only wish I could understand why I wasn't enough. Where did things go wrong? It was such a gradual decay. I cannot pinpoint when things changed. I know that we were happy together. I loved you. I thought you loved me. I don't know how to feel good again, when the person who knew me the most, more than anyone else, more than I know myself, can no longer stand to be with me. Well, I'm gonna feel, feel really cheery after playing this game. Oh my god. Dress for romance.
the moons and the stars. Dear Gertrude, Thank you for your letter telling us the good news that our application has been received. We are very excited to become partners. Or partners. <laughs> very excited to become parents. We are very much looking forward to when there is a child ready for us. Sincerely, The Willows. Dear Mr. and Mrs. Willow, We have received your completed application to adopt a child and we've received confirmation from the inspector that you passed your interview and background checks. Congratulations. There is a waiting list of other applicants, and your application will be added to the queue. The average wait time is six to nine months. On behalf of the agency, I thank you for wanting to open up your home to care for a child in need. Please contact my office if you have any questions. To my love, happy anniversary. These past few years together have been a dream come true. I am so excited to get to have a family with you. I know things have been hard with our jobs here, but I know together we can do anything, and we can even create a loving home in this hard place. So many children have been orphaned because of the dangerous conditions and violence in this region, and I know we can provide a loving home so that at least one of these children will no longer be alone in this scary world. I know some of our family members don't support our decision, but we have to do what is in our hearts. There may be stories of adoption that result in heartbreak, but there are many more stories filled with smiles and happiness. I love you, and I'm so excited about this next exciting chapter of our lives. Yours truly, Elliot Willow. Aw, that's so sweet. Finding Home, a memoir about my adoptive family. To our dearest son, we received your recent letter telling us the news that you and your wife plan on adopting a child. While we are happy that you want to have a family, we don't think it's a good idea to adopt. You won't know this child's background or genetics. Our family has superior genes, and we'd be sad that the child won't look like you. There are so many stories of adopted children that end up abandoning their adopted parents. Don't do this. Love your parents. Oh my god. That's horrible. Our family has superior genes? Fuck off. Childhood Development and Psychology. Yep, so they're reading all about adopting children and how to care for their, their newly adopt, adopted child. So one question at the forefront of my mind is, who am I? Like, who am I playing as? It looks like I'm reading various stories of the, the all the different people that lived in here, in this kind of sick and polluted region, where nobody was really all that happy. But who am I? Oh wait, I've already been in here. Wait, did I go backwards? Oh yeah, I did. Whoops.
Oh, I can't walk this way, can I? Nope. Alright, let's go this way. Are there any, like, newspaper articles in here? Yeah. Yeah, there are. Okay. Uh, New Times, issue 48. Energy boom shows no signs of slowing down. The District Energy Commission released a statement showing energy production is at an, is at an all-time high, with projections of increased production throughout the coming year. Stocks in the mining, energy production, and energy transmission industries are similarly high. Several environmental and... Community organizations, however, continue to express warnings that the Energy Commission should shift energy production to more renewable and less hazardous sources. And what is this on the right side? Like reading comics? Love drinking milkshakes? Come on down to Super Shakes! Burden on Trent. 10% off with this voucher. Life is beautiful, you're beautiful, no regrets, don't look back, move on, and become a stronger person. Coral Canopy. Twin Support Service Specialist. I'll always be there for you. Huh? Ads, I guess. Hmm. There might be something in the tops of these, but I don't really feel like doing it. I mean, what was it? Wasn't it like... That's so slow to do this. I forgot exactly what it was. Wasn't it like the first two are zeros and then the last two are whatever's on the front? So this would be like 5-3 or something? I probably have that wrong, but it's something close to that. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know if there's any newspapers in the locked portions of these things, but... Eh. I don't think it's too important. New cancer risk study, energy workers excluded. The Regional Health Organization is conducting a study of the cancer risks for region residents in response to escalating fears about the possible negative impacts from industrial operations in the area. Director of the study, Dr. Blah Blah Blah, notes that the study focuses only on residential risk. The agency had decided to exclude energy workers. In a letter to the health organization, local health advocates criticized this omission, arguing that by leaving out the risks for energy workers, the study will underestimate the actual risks posed by industrial operations. I'm looking over at the classifieds. For sale, used tombstone. Perfect for someone named Bart Attack. Uh... Bart attack? Okay, I get the feeling this is some sort of Kickstarter or reward thing. I think it is. Yeah. I think that might be some sort of Kickstarter reward thing. Complaints of lack of safety enforcement. Okay. Um, I don't think I need to read all of these. I think I'm starting to get a pretty clear idea about uh, what the news is talking about. Poor safety, poor air quality, basically ruining the environment with their method of energy production. Yeah, members of the Fight for Clean Air Community Organization are collecting anonymous complaints from district workers about violations of safety regulations. Alright, I think I get the idea. Explosion may be worse than previously estimated. Okay, this is this is big. The explosion at the Northeast Power Plant earlier this month may have been worse than previously estimated. The explosion, which was thought to have killed 19 workers and injured dozens more, was caused by a malfunctioning valve in the cooling tower. New reports indicate there were additional workers killed in the blast that are being uncovered in the ongoing reconstruction of the towers. Hmm. 
Could I be, perhaps, one of the killed workers? I do seem rather ghostly, kind of floating around with no footsteps. Alright, that loops around. Uh, this way I can't go. There's a big area that I'm missing, though. Um, yeah, there's a bunch of stuff around the piano and around the library, of course. I don't remember actually how to get there, though. It's been too long. Um, oh, it's right up there. Okay, well, before we do that, let's go over here to the gymnasium. Are there any notes in the gymnasium? It's not really a very noteful place. I don't think so. No, I don't think there are. And uh, we never were able to open this door, right? Yeah. Alright, let's go to the library. Time to do some learning. The Circus of Sands. Oh, this one's actually readable. How long is it? Uh, not too long. But, I mean, it's just a book. Like, could it have any particular relevance to what's happening? Hmm. Well, I guess we're not going to know unless we read it, so <laughs> let's give it a shot. Lemons. They always come in handy. What else would she need? She moved across her darkened room, taking care not to make enough noise to rouse Mummy, and opened her glow-in-the-dark star-adorned toy box. Inside, the assorted items, most of, which, most of which weren't actually toys, but broken items that she could scavenge for parts, were organized into neat lines based on their usefulness, reusability, and, in the case of the few actual children's toys she had decided to keep, plausibility. At the far side of the toy box, there lay a completely unplayed-with horse. It was purple, as well as displaying some extremely unnaturally long eyelashes and an anatomically impossible smile. The horse had bright blue hair. Originally, the toy had also come with a small brush that allowed you to groom it at your leisure. This was no longer anywhere to be found, as Jessica had long since used it to form an integral part of a makeshift dynamo presently residing when within Clicks. Clicks was replacing the Uber. Matronom 3000X nannying droid, which had broken after being struck struck by a golf ball. Jessica's golf ball. Unlike the Matronom, which was state-of-the-art, Clix was simply a state. She had, for a body, an antique damaged flocked writing table on four heavy brass casters. Her CPU was taped to the top of the desk with duct tape. Her user interface was an arcane typewriter. It was awful like a hamster torture chamber. <laughs> it had apparently pointless buttons, levers, screwy things, and things for which there are neither nouns nor simple noun phrases to describe them. And Clix's arms were two crane-like contraptions that moved with all the finesse of an epileptic jackhammer. For hands it wielded a near blunt pair of fabric scissors and a set of barbecue tongs that didn't quite close. Jessica picked up the unrealistically proportioned toy horse and examined it. She then reached back in the box and withdrew a coil of copper wire, an electrical circuit board, some solder, a magnifying glass, and some three-pronged tweezers. Oh, music's coming back. Hi, music. Closing the lid of her toy box, she made her way back over towards the dim lights, lights of her window. After laying out her hoard on the windowsill, she turned and looked at Clix, who stood motionless in the corner of her room. Clix? She whispered as loudly as she dared. No reply. Clix? Wake up, Clix! The robot continued to do nothing, and did it with style. Jessica knew she would have to try something a bit more intelligent to get Clix's attention. So, she pulled a few pieces of clothing from her washing basket and scattered them over the floor untidily. What a mess, she said quietly and slyly, shaking her head. 
Clix was assembled to care. She was assembled to like children, and to want to keep the nest. Her arms started to wave about, and slowly but surely, she started to glide across the bedroom floor, clumsily scooping the garments up and depositing them back in the washing basket. Jessica, on the other hand, was methodically picking out each item that Clix recovered and redistributing them around her bedroom, till Clix's submissiveness snapped. Jessica, behave yourself this instant! Now that Clix was finally working, Jessica's job was done. She stopped withdrawing her used garments from the washing basket, and walked over to Clix, and gave her a big hug around one of her legs. You've got to be shh, she said. Mommy Yummy's asleep. This put Clix into quiet mode, where instead of talking, she would type out her responses onto a sheet of paper. Unfortunately, the clicking of her ancient keys, the squeak of her spool, and the rattle of her type bars was actually louder than her voice modulator. But at least she was trying. I'll be good and tidy up, Clix, whispered Jessica. But you have to give me a lemon from the kitchen. Okay, Jessica, read the paper coming off the roll. And Clix began to trundle towards the door, her brass casters squeaking. Stop, hissed Jessica. Clix did so abruptly and loudly. You have to be quiet, please, Jessica whispered. Okay, Jessica. The loyal robot set off again, about a decibel quieter than before, but what's one decibel in a hundred? Jessica went back to looking at the selection of components on the windowsill, when there occurred a deafening sound. It was either a skip full of cutlery being swept down a mountainside by a swarm of howler monkeys riding on boulders, or clicks carefully descending the stairs. <laughs> I'm glad I read that. That was awesome. Is this actually a real book? I'm going to write this name down and see if it's actually a real book. The Circus of Sands. Yeah, I'm going to search for that later. That sounds like fun. Although it didn't seem to be at all relevant to anything happening in the story. But I'm still glad I read it. It was cute. The Swab's Log from Liberty. Hmm. Oh my god. That's really long. Yeah, I don't... I don't really feel any need to read that. Because I don't feel like it's particularly important to what's happening in the story. The other one didn't seem to be. Even though it was fun to read. I don't know if I feel like... I feel like if I read literally everything, I'm going to get really, really tired. And just completely exhausted. Um, this one's, this one's really short. Yeah, it's just a couple pages. Let's give this a shot. Angels of Men. Tobias was among the crumbling rafters of the abandoned temple, looking through tears at the approaching tragedy below. The child he had saved five years earlier, just before her life began, sobbed alone among the dusty pews. She was looking into the skylight above him and pleading for help and for mercy that he could not give her. Everything he was, and once was, hurt. His mind screamed for him to intervene, but couldn't. There was nothing he could do. Even now, as he understood what was about to happen, he could only look down upon her and wonder why he had once been given the chance to save her, only for her to have to endure this night. From below, the hollow echoes of a door unlocking and its tortured creak as it was pushed open reverberated through the nave. The child stopped her prayers and looked towards an expanding shaft of bright yellow light cascading through the doorway. A shadowy figure carrying a small flashlight stepped across the threshold, its gentle footfalls the only sound as it approached her. Tobias flinched as the girl's features flashed for an instant in the light, and he noticed an expression of relief gracing her features as the dark and lanky figure stopped next to her. She was smiling up at it, and a pang of immeasurable sorrow ripped through him as he watched the figure sit down next to her. 
He'll be here soon, the dark figure whispered. She nodded. Will it hurt? I'm scared. The figure shook its head forcefully. No, don't be scared. It will be like going to sleep. I could never hurt you. I promise. She exhaled a hesitant, stuttering breath, her bottom lip quivering nervously as it began. And the little girl, whose life had been one of pain and sorrow, and whose name begged mercy, found it as she took the figure's hand in hers, raised it to her face, and cried, cried her last tear upon it. Tobias had to close his eyes. I don't want to read these, they're so depressing. Oh god, no. I'll just briefly glance at them and if they're super short or if they seem really important, maybe I'll read them, but otherwise... The Helping Friendly Book. Well, that sounds nice. Oh, this one's actually really short. Alright. Once there was a large man named Ernest. Ernest wasn't a good writer, but he wanted to try to write a book. So he hired a ghostwriter. The only thing was, this ghostwriter was an actual ghost. His name was Rutherford, and he was on a quest to save Ernest from meeting his untimely doom, which would apparently occur soon. Rutherford warned Ernest that sooner or later he would die a terrible death. But Ernest, like all good protagonists, didn't listen. Then, one day, Ernest was going for his morning walk, when he one day slipped on a banana peel and landed on his stomach. Somehow, he had managed to give himself a small cut above his left nipple. Later that day, the cut grew bigger. He decided to go to the hospital to have it checked out. While in the hospital, he was walking past the NICU, when all of a sudden, everything went black, and Ernest was dead. Now, how has this book been helping and friendly, you ask? It hasn't been helping or friendly at all, you say? Well, that's not our problem. <laughs> what the fuck? I have been misled. That was not helping or friendly. I am very disappointed. Debate continues over subsidies for energy sources. The legislature continues to debate whether the federal government should continue to subsidize traditional sources of energy. Alright, I think I'll just leave it there. Once again, I get the idea. So old sources of energy were sticking around much, much longer than they uh, should have. Still don't know what's up with this piano. I still don't know if I actually played it properly and it activated something or, or what happened there. Guess I'll just leave it for now. Yeah, and the last thing that I unlocked was this down here. But uh, I'm pretty sure there's still more things to read. Uh, there's no reason to read this warning note. Yeah, it's just talking about how to activate the, the elevator, which I've already done. Okay, um... I've already been here. If I just loop back around... I'm not really sure... No? No, I don't think I have. Yeah, no, I haven't been here. Okay. I mean, at least I haven't been here after, uh, after reading the notes. Dear Shane, how am I really doing? Well, the truth is, I know I've been here for over a year now, but I still don't think I'll ever get used to this place. I miss the beauty of our family, uh, of our family farm more and more every day. 
If only things were different. If only the drought didn't ravage the countryside, turning our fertile soils into dust. I know we didn't have any options. Our only choice was for some of us to leave to find work, and hopefully send money back home to those that stayed. I know I had to go, but I still feel so heartbroken to have left. You are my soulmate, the bestest sister in the whole world. I love you forever. I miss you and mommy and daddy every day. Please give a big hug to the animals for me. Your favorite sister, Mariah. Mariah, congratulations on your promotion. That is so great. You've been working so hard. I'm so glad they finally are rewarding you for it. But how are you feeling? Lately, you've only been telling me about work and how dire the operations are getting there. I worry about you all the time, and whether you're holding up okay. We received your latest money transfer. Thank you. I think we're going to use the money to fix the fences around the parts of the farm that are still getting enough water to be fruitful. We worry that as things continue to get worse, some people might try to steal our crops. I've been taking some of our harvests, uh, what little we can spare, down to the homeless shelter as often as I can, but they still need so much more. We miss you all the time. Shane. Alright, so this was actually the letter sent right before the one I just read. Yeah, because Shane asks, how are you feeling? And then she answers, How am I really doing? Ecology Ethic. Oh, this one can't be read. Yeah, only some of the books can be read. Some of them are just the titles and that's it. Alright, so there's nothing in here. I came from behind me, so let's keep going this way. Science Fiction Shorts, Volume 3. <laughs> this one is readable. The Rover. Oh, well, they weren't kidding about short. Just one page. It had been over a hundred years since the Rover sent a transmission. Yet there it was, coming in loud and clear. The century-old rover was talking again. You see, we humans, we left it out there, and they found it, they fixed it. For them, it was probably simple. Now that simple rover that was designed by a team your great-grandfather was a part of, that simple rover designed to look for life, has become our robotic ambassador to the first alien life we found. We make things, and sometimes, if we're lucky, we make something that can have an unimaginable impact. We just hope it will be for the better. The young inventor only half listened. He was busy making things of his own. But eventually he'd learn the lesson for himself. Desolus. Ampere. Uh, these are all by the same person, Russell Paxton. Oh wait, they're actually written by this person. This person's a writer. Dear Russell Paxton, The regional short story writing competition is quickly approaching, and we do hope you submit an entry this year. We very much enjoyed your submission last year, and are looking forward to what you've been working on lately. Random story idea notes. If a robot inventor invented a machine that could make anything that started with the letter N, what would the machine create when asked to create nothing? <laughs> what? All 
Alright, so living in this place, we have an inventor. We have someone who came from a farm and their farm wasn't doing well, so they came here to earn money to send back home. We have a couple who are trying to adopt a child. A lot of different people. Wait, I was just in here, wasn't I? Right? Yeah, what the heck? I went backwards again. No, just talking about combinations, spare keys. Dear Mr. Riggins, this letter is in response to your inquiry regarding the scope of protection afforded to whistleblowers, and whether you would qualify as a whistleblower under the law of this jurisdiction. From what you have conveyed to me, I believe you'd be protected under the letter of the law. However, given the recent political climate, there have been several cases of individuals who deserved protection, but the government found reasons to deny them protection, for political reasons. From our preliminary investigations conducted by our investigative team. It appears that there are indeed violations of several environmental laws occurring on an ongoing basis, putting the entire region at risk. My advice is for you to go public with your information, and myself and my colleagues are ready to defend you to the fullest extent provided under the law. However, I do warn you that it will be a difficult battle with many risks. Alright, so somebody's actually trying to do something about what was happening here. Page 98. I'm reaching the point where I can no longer turn a blind eye to what is going on. I'm not sure what to do about it. But I just can't ignore it any longer, pretending everything is okay. What are my ethical obligations? To my supervisors, to the people working under me, to the community, to myself. I have worked so hard to get where I am. It's been a long road to get to become the assistant manager of operations in my department. I'm sure many would kill for my job, because I get paid more, and have more opportunities for future promotions. Does that all mean I should just do what my supervisors want me to do, and not say anything about all the problems that I see? I just heard from a neighbor that those filing cabinets in the large community room down the hall used to be in my apartment. I guess the guy that used to live in my apartment, uh, in my apartment unit, who was the manager before I took over the position, was transferred to a different district really quickly. The move was so quick that he didn't take all of his belongings with him, and a bunch of filing cabinets were left. The janitor moved them down the hall, and I don't think he even realized what is still in there. There are slides and newspaper articles in there that make me think the previous manager was concerned about some of the same awful things I'm seeing now, that I'm seeing now that I have his old job. I guess he never spoke up about them, but I think I will. I finally found an attorney to talk with. I'm hoping he'll have some advice about what I should do. I think there are definitely some laws being broken. I started to have doubts today. If I do speak out about what I'm seeing, will I lose my job? Where will I go? Would it even make a difference? <laughs> Secrets to being a powerful leader. It's interesting. At first I thought the story the story was like a very very simple story about loss and it was just kind of about maybe two people or like three people, you know, like parents losing a child or something like that. But it seems like it's actually about a like a whole apartment block. It's about all the people that lived here. The manager trying to do the right thing. The couple trying to raise a kid in this horrible place. The daughter trying to send money back to the farm. 
Oh, and here we go, we've looped all the way around. Okay, well, I think... I mean, I maybe... I didn't read all the books, and perhaps there's a note or two that I missed, but I think that's pretty much it for the top floor. Yeah, I think the next place to go is probably down the elevator and see what I can read down there. And I still don't know who I am, though. Who am I? Am I... <laughs> am I the ghost writer? Am I the ghost writing the story of all these people? That have long since left this place? Perhaps, perhaps, perhaps. Anyway, I think this is a pretty good place to end it. This game sure is getting even more depressing than it was before. <laughs> Between the music and this abandoned place and these stories of... like, loss and pain and hardship, uh, God. Ah, oh, it is depressing. But, uh... I'm still curious to learn more about what's going on. So, I hope you've enjoyed so far. And when I return, I'm going to go down the elevator shaft and see what there is to read on the bottom floor.